United States government presents, presents, pre pre presents. Rebellion. The highest values devaluing themselves. The idea that we are responsible, we do have choices, no matter how complicated or fast moving the world is. Human existence becomes very, very clear when Kierkegaard begins to meditate and think deeply about the choices that human beings must, by virtue of the human condition, make. What is agonizing, what is awful about this decision is that you have no grounds for making it, and you have to make it, and your soul is depending upon it. Your felicity is depending upon it. It's the most important choice in human life, and you have no star to steer by, and never will. What a horrible universe he's created for us. What a terrifically difficult set of problems he faces us with. And he will accept no compromise, either or. You can see how he disdains Hegelian synthesis of, either, of any kind. Because Hegel would say, well, we'll get a little bit of this, we'll get a little bit of that, we'll get a thesis, an antithesis, we'll synthesize. Hegel says, no synthesis, no compromise. This or that. Decide which. If you refuse to decide, well, you started out as an aesthetic man to begin with. You were born in the state of nature. People naturally pursue pleasure. If you don't want to decide, we know where you stand. You've decided already. So we're stuck with the ultimate theological problem, and we have no way of solving it. A man who thinks about things like this all the time and who manages to come up with this sort of problem is not a happy person. Even when he finds God, having put himself through this harrowing theological experience, he feels that it is very difficult for him to explain to people what the significance of the ultimate moral theological choice is. He feels that people that haven't suffered for what they believe almost have no right to it. That you earn your desserts you earn your stripes as an intellectual by not only thinking problems through, but feeling them through. Romantic intellectuals like feeling over reason. They like grand and beautiful emotions. They emphasize sentiment. If you think of Charles Dickens' novels, if you think of Berlioz's music, too much of everything. They have no sense of proportion, but they have lovely sentiments. Well, Kierkegaard has no sense of proportion and has very frightening sentiments. They have horrific sentiments, but they have their unique appeal. So in the volume one, in the either, he presents some very arresting images. He writes from the perspective of the aesthetic man and explains to us what it's like to be us as if we didn't know. And in fact, here God thinks that we don't know. He, doesn't, he thinks that we don't entirely comprehend the wretched state of the purely natural aesthetic man. I think it's T.S. Eliot that once uh, wrote a line describing uh, the hollow man, I believe. He said that they're uh, distracted from distraction by distraction. Well, Kierkegaard thinks that that's what the life of the aesthetic man is. It's one distraction after another to prevent you from seeing the vacuum of your existence to prevent you from looking right at the void and being turned into stone. He says that's why you pursue pleasure all the time, because the real evil or the real misery in the life of the aesthetic man is boredom. Kierkegaard says, and I think it's one of the greatest lines in the history of philosophy, it's beautiful and it's horrifyingly true. He says that boredom is the root of all evil. Think about that, it's much more dangerous than money. Think about the amount of evil that is introduced into the world by people's simple desire for sensation. And Kierkegaard, of course, in his own inimitable and most unkind, ironic way, talks about the history of boredom in a piece called The Rotation Method, sometimes translated as The Rotation of Crops. And he describes the origins of boredom. It's beautiful. He said God created man because he was bored. Adam was alone. He was bored. He asked for Eve. Adam and Eve were bored together, they had some children, then they were bored on Famia, and then people multiplied and reproduced, and then they, were, then they were bored on Moms, and everywhere boredom took over the world. Eventually people created the Tower of Babel, which is an idea that is as boring as the tower is high, and the reason they did that is sheer boredom. That's the only reason people put together culture at all. It's boring. The world is full of nothing, and that we fill this nothing up with trivialities like human culture. Oh, you, you feel the breath of infinite spaces in this guy. He, he, he lives in a kind of interstellar space of the soul that has nothing in it. And he says, the, 
problem is, is that you think that about me because I'm such a perverse writer, but in fact it's all true about you. And that's what your life amounts to. And that's what it means to make the aesthetic choice. This leads to two possible things. It leads to a continuation of it where you die on your own with the more impressive self-consciousness on the part of the aesthetic man. They choose something a little bit more stylish, a little bit more tasteful. They commit suicide. Kierkegaard believes that if anyone were to actually become conscious of what it means to be an aesthetic man, to be constantly pursuing new flavors, new tastes, new sensations, new experiences, you would just get it over with now. It's so horribly boring that the board would drive you just to exterminate yourself. That's the active rather than the passive form of the aesthetic man. He gives an image that you would expect from Nietzsche. He said, at a theater one evening, a fire broke out backstage. And one of the clowns came out onto the stage and announced to the audience that the theater was on fire. They thought it was a joke and they laughed. And he told them, no, really, the theater is on fire. You are in terrible peril. And the more he told them that, the funnier they thought it was and the more they laughed. This is Kierkegaard's self-conception. He is a joker who is deadly serious. And you people are laughing at him, thinking that he's a religious kook, when in fact, you are in mortal peril. You are going through the dark night of the soul. You are so detached from your souls, you don't know it. What a horrifying 